chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3 is the text that we will look at this evening, and I will read verses 1 through 7. Brothers, sisters, let us give our attention to the word of the Lord. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden. But God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food, pleasing to the eye, and also, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some of it and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened. And they realized they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Amen. We'll end our reading there, and let's pray together. Father in heaven, as we read this text, a very sobering text, as we consider the entrance of sin into the world and the deception of Satan, the uh, disobedience of our first parents, Lord, sober us and arm us in our conflict against Satan, who goes around as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, grant us grace to overcome his temptations, that you would lead us not into temptation, but should we find ourselves in trials, that you would deliver us from the evil one, and make us to rejoice in the Savior, who himself took on flesh and overcame temptation in order to save us from our sins. And we give you our thanks, our praise, and ask for your help, praying in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, last week we began looking at the topic of Satan and his fall. We've been making our way through Mark in the morning, and we have frequently seen Jesus interacting with demons, casting out the powers of darkness, spoiling Satan's kingdom as he inaugurates and introduces his own kingdom, the kingdom of light, as Colossians says, the kingdom of God's dear son. We've been transferred out of the domain of darkness and into the kingdom of the son he loves. And as we look at those stories, I think it raises questions. Okay, where do these demons come from? Uh, Who is this character, Satan, whom Jesus says, I saw fall like lightning from heaven. Where did this all begin? How did it all go wrong? Now, I think we know the general answers to those questions, that he was an angel who fell due to his own pride. But I also think it's one of those ones where I know that's in the Bible somewhere. And so it might be good, it is good, I would say, then to look at some of these texts that we've already looked at in order to establish the idea of, okay, here's some of the principal passages that set before us the fall of Satan. Here's why we read in Ezekiel 28 or in Isaiah 14, and though the prophet is addressing uh, an earthly ruler, we see that at the same time he's peeling back the curtain to show us the ultimate reality behind that evil ruler, an evil force, a fallen angel that is influencing the direction of wicked kingdoms. And those are the texts that we looked at last Lord's Day. Now, we also read a passage last Lord's Day from 2 Corinthians that makes a statement about Satan and argues that we are not ignorant of his devices. In other words, we're aware of his strategies. We know how he likes to work. If you speak to any leader in the military who's a, a wise strategist, no doubt they have their own plan for success. And they also have a general understanding of how other uh, military leaders like to operate or how famous ones in history have operated in order to be wise strategists. And it does us well then to look into the scriptures and see how Satan likes to operate. Not because of any kind of morbid uh, fascination with demons and the demonic or some kind of you know, juvenile humor about Satan, but in order to be armed against temptation. And that's why we've come to the passage we have tonight. 
Genesis chapter 3, because this is a paradigm of temptation. This is your blueprint, your textbook example of how Satan likes to work in deceiving and tempting God's people to sin. It's a passage that shows us the deadly consequences of sin. It's a passage that shows us God's grace in the gospel, even though, to overcome sin and death. So what I want to do is just work through this passage. I've I've just got a, a, a short list of main ideas that emerge from each interaction between Satan and the woman, and then want to apply that in a few different areas to our life. Let's look at Satan's interaction here with Adam and Eve, Eve in particular in the opening verses. When Satan acts to tempt, here's the first thing that usually happens, disguise. You see that in the opening verse where we read, now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. When Satan comes to tempt Adam and Eve, and again, Eve in particular here, he doesn't show up, does he, as the red demon with the pitchfork and the horns. I think it's First or Second Corinthians makes the point. Satan transforms himself into an angel of light. When he appears to deceive you and to tempt you, he is never going to come And put sin right in front of you and say, look at this deadly, awful thing. Wouldn't you like to do that? Because most of us would shun that. We would flee that. He comes in disguise. And according to Genesis 3 here, he finds an optimal opportunity in the serpent. The text says that the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. Now remember, we are dealing at this point with unfallen Creation. I do take these as a, as a literal account. So what we're looking at here is the creation of the world by the direct act of God, the formation of Adam and Eve, placing them in this garden paradise, the formation of all the animals that were then brought before Adam to name and to classify. And apparently within that order of animals, there is a crafty serpent. Now, when we read crafty, we think negative. Of course, because of this text, we might think sinful. But crafty isn't always wicked. It could just be subtle. Whatever it is about the way God made the serpent, this animal lent itself to subtlety or to craftiness. And so Satan says, okay, that's what I'm going to use to try to deceive the man and the woman. Again, the woman in particular when it comes here to deception. Uh, If we can infer from the curse on the serpent... You'll crawl on your belly all the days of your life. Apparently at this point, uh, the serpent was not necessarily a belly-crawling animal. I don't want to speculate too much on the details that aren't uh, revealed, but this animal that God had made and designed this way, yet Satan used as an opportunity to disguise himself in order to deceive Eve. Uh, Later in the word of God. In Joshua 9, you'll read about the Gibeonites. Remember them who uh, lived very close to the Israelites and feared they would be next when the conquest was taking place. So they disguised themselves as travelers from a far land. They put old clothes and sandals on them. They brought uh, bread that had already gotten old and gave the appearance of going on a long journey in order to form a treaty with the Israelites that they would not exterminate them. And they were Crafty, the word of God says. Same word here that refers to Satan. He comes in disguise. Now, maybe you're thinking then, well, man, okay, if if Satan always comes in disguise disguise and he's he's deceptive, how am I going to know when he's coming? Adam and Eve should have known something was not right here. God had made them alone with the gift of speech. God had endowed them alone with his image. They were the only talking people in all of creation other than God and his angels. So when a serpent shows up and starts talking, they should have been alarmed. And particularly when this serpent goes on to begin advocating rebellion against God, their maker, they should have been alarmed. And so while Satan is deceptive, while he does employ disguises, he will reveal himself. He'll out himself by asking you and tempting you to do things that are contrary to God's word, that go contrary to nature, that go contrary to your sense and your conscience and the right and wrongs that God has revealed 
in his word. There are ways to be sharp to his disguises. But he comes in disguise. Then he begins to deprecate God's word. Look at the end of verse 1. In my translation, it reads like this. He said to the woman, Did God really say, You must not eat from any tree in the garden? Now, no matter which translation you're reading, it brings out that sense of Satan questioning God's word. Okay, did God indeed say this? Did God truly say this, but he's, I don't think his strategy is, okay, maybe you heard him wrong. Maybe you remembered wrong. His point is here to cast a, a, a dispute or, or, or to deprecate, I've already said, to make God's prohibition look bad. We could render it like this. You've got to be kidding, Eve. God didn't really say you can't eat from any tree in the garden, did he? In other words, he wants to make God's rules look petty. He wants to make God's rules look restrictive. He wants God's rules to be made out to be uh, outmoded or outdated or puritanical or just the uh, evidences of religious zealots. Whatever it is, he wants God's prohibitions to look bad, to look foolish. And so he does this. He, He says, God, did God really say that? Are you kidding me? That's the kinds of things that God has told you. And and we'll discuss why he took that strategy in just a moment. But know again, this is how Satan leads. Uh, This is something our culture struggles with, though though we want our first application to be, let's look at our own hearts. But this is something we see uh, in the wider culture. It's not that there's a, a sane evaluation of God's word. There's just mockery and rejection of it. That's what the natural heart does. It looks at God's prohibitions as overly restrictive, as cruel, and as something to be laughed at. Now I want you to know in verses I want you to notice in verses two and three Eve's defense. And I'm gonna I'm gonna come to Eve's uh, I'm gonna get her back for a minute here, okay? Because usually when these verses are read, she, she's painted in a more negative light than she should be. Now she's not gonna come out of this looking well, but I'm not going that direction. But verses two and three aren't the problem yet. Look at what she says. The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from any trees in the garden. But God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you will die. Now, notice that Eve says we can't eat from the tree and we must not touch it. Now, if you go back and read the exact prohibition that God gave, the very wording, he never directly said you must not touch it. He said don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So some have said that when Eve says you must not touch it, she's adding to God's word. That this is a sinful addition to the word of the Lord. That it reflects perhaps a a growing bitterness in her heart that views God as overly restrictive. Now, there's a problem with that. She's not fallen yet. Now, like I said, she's not going to come out of this well. She's going to be deceived in sin. We all already know that. But if she's already thinking of God as, bit, uh, as overly restrictive and she's chafing under his rules and she's, and she's harboring rebellion towards him, then she's already sinned. Uh, she's already fallen and disobeyed God. And there's no indication in the text that she has sinned yet. Furthermore, the word touch could be rendered as strike or assault, reflecting this, that Eve is basically saying, don't interact with the tree. God said, don't eat from the tree. He said, don't interact with the tree. Because if you think about it, you know, she could reason like a child, right? Well, you know, he said, he said, don't eat it, but we could touch it and handle it. And I'm not touching you, right? You've heard little kids do that. When she says not touch it, she's not adding to his word. She's just inferring what he was saying. Don't mess with the tree. Stay away from it. It's bad for you. You've got all this stuff to enjoy. And all that tree will bring you is death and disobedience. So I think she makes a good start here 
when she resists the serpent's temptation with the truth of God. We'll say more about why that didn't continue in a moment. But once she gives that response to the serpent in verse 4, Satan then changes his strategy. Instead of trying to cast uh, deprecation on God's word, he outright denies it. Look at verse 4. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman. All right, Eve had said, we can't eat from it, we can't touch it. If we do, we'll die. And Satan says, no, you won't. And I'm going to steal this from Lig Duncan, Lectures on Covenant Theology. But notice here in the scripture, what is the first doctrine that Satan attacks? The doctrine of judgment. The idea that there is an actual, real punishment for sin. That's how he'll delude unbelievers to make them think there's no uh, hell, there's no consequences, there's no wrath of God, there's no punishment for their sin, and that's how he'll delude you. Hey, nothing's going to come of this. I I can play with this and get away with it, and nothing's going to come of it, and it is nothing but a lie and an outright denial of what God, your kind, loving Heavenly Father, who wants good for you, has told you in his word. Notice then his strategy here, the the reason behind uh, his deprecation of God's word. Verse verse 5, you won't surely die, but God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. What is Satan saying? The only reason he's withheld that tree from you is because he's petty, he's jealous, He's selfish. He wants to keep that area of knowledge to himself. And not only is he selfish, but he's keeping from you something you need. He's keeping from you something that will make you happy because he's possessive. He wants it all to himself, and you can't trust him. So he he, he attacks the truth of God's word. He attacks the seriousness of God's work, and, and he attacks the character of God. To make, as I've already said, our our kind Heavenly Father, the Creator God, who had given them so much, out to be just petty, jealous, selfish. You see this argument these days of, you know, how can God ask people to worship Him? That's that's bigoted, that's self-centered, that's narcissistic. If any person was acting like that, we would think uh, that they were mad or that they were wicked. Yes, we would, because people shouldn't act like that. God's the only one who actually has the right to say, worship me. And by the way, every time he does, it's for your good to draw you out of yourself so you can actually see something that's so beautiful and worth beholding, that you become the person God meant for you to become, someone conformed to his image. Now, having launched his assault, Eve begins in verse 6 to deliberate. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, And also desirable for gaining wisdom. All right, she's beginning to think, hey, maybe this tree would benefit me. Maybe it would give me what I need. Think of 1 John 2.15, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. That that, that This tree will complete me. This tree will satisfy uh, something within me that God cannot. She has to make a choice. Does she trust those senses, what she feels? feels in the moment, what she wants in the moment, or does she believe the promises of God? And at the end of verse 6, she declares her rebellion. This is a bad declaration of independence. When she saw these things, she took some and ate it. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. She declares her independence by giving in to deception. She has believed a lie. She has exchanged the truth of God for a lie. Sadly, notice the phrase there, she gave it to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Adam outright rebels. He's not deceived. He was not, he didn't hear and entertain the lie. Rather, he, in just a moment of hard-hearted wickedness, an outright rebellion spits in the face of God and eats this fruit. He, the phrase that he was with her, some take to be that he was present during these things, that he beheld what was going on, but that he did not assume and arise to his duty 
in order to protect that family from spiritual harm, rather choosing to engage in rebellion against God. And that's why Romans 5 attributes death entering the world to Adam's rebellion. 1 Timothy 2 makes a distinction between Eve being uh, deceived, whereas Adam being a willful transgressor of God's law, which is a much more serious pronouncement. I'll say something about that in just a moment. But verse 7 gives the final result. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. No sooner had they eaten when they realized it was a lie. No sooner had they begun to give in to temptation, and they knew it was a lie. That's, it's the great deception. It's the great bait and switch. This will make you happy, and as soon as you begin to do it, death Enters. Now, others have, have, have written, p- people who have engaged in immorality, other sins, and, and later repented and said, no, that sorrow may not kick in the first moment. That's part of what makes it so deceptive, that there may be an enjoyment and an excitement to sin, but that sorrow and that death and that emptiness does eventually come when people rebel against God's Word And all the wickedness that's in the world today, all the sorrow, all the death, all the sickness, it's all traced back to this sad, monumental act of rebellion. Now let's make some applications before we conclude this evening. One's, again, to challenge us, to sober us, but also leave us when we are done with hope in God's grace and gospel. We, we've touched on these, but let me just make them plain for you. Number one. When facing temptation, friend, remember this. God does not withhold good things from his people. He never withholds from you something you need. He never withholds from you something that will satisfy you in your inner person. Everything that you need to be a a satisfied soul before God, he gives you. He gives it to you primarily in himself. He's, He's the best thing you could ever have that you drink of the water of life and eat the bread of life, and that you find your soul satisfaction in Jesus, you won't find anything better. Now, God gives many good gifts in this world. We're not platinous. We, we, don't, we don't pretend that this world is just all bad and going to burn up, and, and we want to get to this, uh, this non-physical world where we can just exist as spirits. God made this creation. It's good. He will destroy it one day. He'll make a new heavens and a new earth, a new creation in which righteousness will dwell Forever. And the good creator God gives many good gifts. And so whatever of those gifts you need, he's going to give to you. Whatever you need in order to live the life and the calling that he has given to you, he will give you and he will never withhold good things from his people. The second thing to realize is we have to therefore unmask temptation for the lie that it is. Because temptation makes sin look attractive. Again, it makes it look like something you need. It makes it look like something you will enjoy. It makes it look like God, again, is being petty and evil. And it is only death. Sin will present itself to you as pleasurable, as something that you deserve, as something that you're entitled to, as something that won't bring you any harm. And you have got to, in the moment, unmask that lie for what it is. (laughs) How do you do that, you ask? With the word of God. Uh, Went to the graduation Friday night for Brian McCullough. He preached for me earlier this month. Some of you were there. And the pastor preached on Jesus' temptation. So let me just steal a few of his thoughts uh, for a moment. But Jesus tempted to make bread out of rocks. Why? Because you've been fasting 40 days. Take the easy way out. Your father's not going to provide for you. Just take matters into your own hand. Turn stones into bread. Jesus unmasked that temptation with God's truth. Man won't live on bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. I've got what I need. Even if I'm in the wilderness and fasting, I have what I need from the word of God. Throw yourself off the temple. God will catch you up in his hands. Do this great act to prove, to make God prove himself, and then all the crowds will adore you. And no more ministering in obscurity, but rather you'll be the center of attention. And Jesus saying, that is not the way God has designed for me. I won't put him to the test where he has to show up and prove himself. I'll trust in his word. And then his will. And then Satan says, bow down and worship me. I'll give you all the kingdoms of the earth. You can have the glory. 
You can have the authority that the Son of Man is going to have, and you can do it without the cross. And Jesus says, no, I can't go that way because I've come to die for the sins of my people, and then I'll be raised in vindication of God's faithfulness. And then I will receive the kingdom that he has given me. Satan is telling you, take the easy way out. Take matters into your own hands. Do things for yourself. Whereas Jesus is saying, whatever I need, God is going to give me if I follow his way. And he will satisfy me with himself. Three, mortify temptation. I do believe that in this uh, exchange, I think Eve started well. But she didn't finish well. Paul uses the language of put sin to death, mortify your members, the old King James says, which are upon the earth. Put sin to death. And you know what Adam and Eve should have done? I'll steal again from Ligon. If you've got a snake talking that is contrary to creation's design and advocating rebellion against the God who made you and gave you this garden, you either kill him or you apprehend him and take him to God when he shows up at the end of the day walking in the cool of the day as he liked to do. They should have, they should have, they should have not even listened to him. They should have known. Red flags should have been going off everywhere. What's going on with a talking serpent? And, and we're not going to cast stones because none of us would have done better. But what we do when we face temptation is not just give it a soft answer and a soft no. We put it to death. We mortify it the instant it begins. We make the decisions in our mind with our thoughts or in our emotions, the way we're reacting to other people or in our disputes with others. I'm just going to stop the minute it begins. Turn that thought off in my mind. Walk away from a bad situation. Take a deep breath and, and, just, and just cool off and, and, and recite some scripture. Get out of the room, whatever it takes, mortify temptation, put it to death. I do think there, there is the call in Scripture for men in particular that we take leadership in our homes and in the church that God has given us to fight the battle against temptation. Uh, the text says that she gave the fruit to Adam who was there with her, and he ate. And, I, and I've heard two humorous explanations of that. One is Adam was the first, like, just total weak-willed man. He couldn't stand up to his wife, so she said eat the fruit, and he ate it. Uh, I've also heard someone say, you'll like this one, uh, Adam is a type of Christ. He couldn't bear to be without his bride, so he took death in order to have his bride, and he, and he prefigures Jesus. Now, that, friends, that is not what's going on here. Adam was a rebel. <laughs> Adam failed in his duty before God. And that's why 1 Timothy 2 makes the point in discussing women teaching in the church. And Paul says, I don't, I don't permit a woman to teach, to exercise authority over man, to hold that kind of teaching office. Why? Because man was formed first. In other words, God did make Adam first. And he gave him that command not to eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. That was given to him before he had formed Eve. So to Adam alone was this responsibility given, obey me and make sure that obedience is rendered to me by my uh, creation, by the wife that I will soon uh, give you. And then in 1 Timothy 2, it goes on to say, and the woman was deceived and fell in the transgression. In other words, I think the point of that statement is Satan in his strategy usurped God's created order. Satan did not engage with Adam to whom God had given the command. He gave, the, he did the subtle workaround to try to deceive his wife. And I think Paul's point there is when we fight against God's created order, when we don't assume the responsibilities given to us in the church and in the home with regards to spiritual leadership, disaster strikes. So I do think, men, there, there, there's particularly a challenge to us. Uh, if you're married as a husband or any man in this church, that, that we rise to the occasion of responsibility God has given us to lead in as an example of walking in the ways of the Lord and communicating the word of God to others. Women, of course, given quite a position of responsibility in the church of, of godly uh, women, women teaching women, women being involved in all manner of spiritual growth. But, but those two areas, particularly responsibility given to the men of the church. And lastly, fourthly, finally, that we rest in the success of the one who was tempted in our place and resisted sin. 
In Matthew 4 and in Luke 4, we see once again a man tempted by the devil when he is hungry, when he is weary, and he is asked to rebel against God, and he obeys in our place. And so we have a perfect new last Adam who overcame temptation, who did not rebel against God, and instead went to the cross to pay for every single time you and I give in to temptation. And you need to rejoice in that. You need to to just rest in that as God's complete and full forgiveness of you. Repent of over, repent of giving in to temptation, repent of spiritual lethargy, repent of sin, rest in the perfect obedience of one who has paid for every single time you sin and give it temptation. But with that, resting is your foundation as the strong anchor of your soul. Then, brothers, sisters, let's, let's diligently give ourselves to overcoming temptation with God's truth. Let's pray. Father in heaven, you are a good God.